Hey. Hi there. Here we Hello, are. Hello, everyone. Now, I'm going to reveal myself in a minute, but we're going to wait for a few more people to join us. That still doesn't sound right, Will. No. Well, I, <laughs> I have given you, it's a surprise. Anyone who's watching, okay. it's, it's going to be a surprise to, to Mikhail and Roderick as well. That's um, true. Yeah, but I, I promised them that I am dressed and I haven't got a costume or any tattoos to hide. That, that, so which I'll show you in a moment. But I thought it was only suited because we had a record-breaking 400 attendees have signed up for this, by the way. Wow, well done. Oh, well done to you. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I, I think it's... Well um, done to us. Yes, exactly. Yes. I think it's you two that have, have done that. It's, you know, I'm, I'm just setting a stage for you two. Where are we? I just want to look at the time. One minute in. And... Reveal. No, hold on. Okay, right. let me let me just check. I'm just checking LinkedIn to see we're there. Okay, so who would like to see what I'm wearing for you guys? <laughs> what I'm not wearing? For no, 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 no. Okay, listen. I thought about this, and I've worked with you two before. That's how we know each other. We worked on projects, and all of us sort of did a work from home. And we've got you know Mr. Nomad there, Roderick traveling around the place. We're often in t-shirts, and you know crypto and blockchains often got that kind of hoodie t-shirty kind of relaxed style about it and but blockchain's moved on and i thought we've got an occasion here we've got an occasion we have two you know legends in their own tokenomic lifetimes so it's only suited that one is wearing and dressed accordingly <laughs> there you go <laughs> it's a very up. very serious there subject we have here dressing up there yes it. and i oh, am nice. absolutely boiling that is the <laughs> i'll take these off because they're for reading glass. The last time I wore this actually was Cardano Summit last year. So you it guys works. are privileged. Nice. Usually this is just for Fred and, and Charles, but it's for you guys. And for, and for everyone, everyone watching as well. So, so where are we? Okay, you're reading well, the room, Will. Uh, let's get it started, right? We're ready to kick off. Should, Should we go? Uh, yeah, round of intro. Yeah, okay. Well, thanks everyone for joining. For those of you who are live, and thanks for those of you who are watching this on playback. We have with us today two, you know, you know, double the fun. We have two experts that I pulled from the, 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 the not the non-experts we often have on LinkedIn, which is what this is all about, bringing you experts, uh, Mikhail, and we have Roderick. Both of them are economists, and both of them focus 100% on, on tokenomics. Just because I've got Mikhail no, here next to me, I'll let you kick off, Mikhail. Okay, yeah, great being here. Thank you for the invite, Will, and uh, I'm really looking forward to this. So... As Will mentioned, I'm, I have a master's degree in managerial economics, a background in project finance, and I have been, let's say, working with crypto projects and enterprises on the token economics hands-on since 2017. And most recently, <coughs> I've been a co-founder of a DAO. It's called Triple A DAO, and it's a DeFi. It's a DeFi DAO that's building zero-interest lending protocol. And I'm also, let's say, a founder of web3e.eu, where I'm offering my economics expertise as a service. So for anybody who wants to navigate the treacherous waters of economics and token design and allocation, they can let's say, work with me at a very affordable monthly subscription to get somebody trustworthy on their side. So that's... that's Affor me. Affordable sounds affordable and attractive too. Thank you, Roderick. Hey, everyone. So strangely, I discovered that I have the same background as Michal. Just before starting blockchain, I originally worked in project finance as well. So this is the art of financing infrastructure, which involves these year deal processes that take years or <laughs> to put together. And you have to build these really complicated quantitative tools to get everybody comfortable to sign off on the hundreds of millions needed to build this stuff. And uh, so that meant that by the end of it, I was a dab hand with a spreadsheet and I pivoted into a freelance career working with all kinds of businesses and situations. And then somehow COVID stopped me on a tropical island and I, I networked with some blockchain insiders out there and they saw what I could do and thought I would be a good hand to help them out with some tokenomics. And that kick-started my career in, in blockchain. And I really have had to discover what that role entails for me. You know, we started off sort of like just structuring these sales these for, for these new tokens, and then went into deeper questions like, how do we make these tokens useful? How do we create a sustainable economy? And I found myself reaching back into my educational training. I have a background in economics like Mikhail as well. 
And, and, you know, I was riveted suddenly, you know, I went to university wanting to make the world a better place. And then economics, conventional economics treat, teaches you that we can't do anything about it. And, and you have to pass exams explaining why the world is messed up and we can't make it any better. And then along comes blockchain and you have this amazing new suite of tools. And suddenly like a lot of things, a lot of these deep problems can be unpicked and solved. And it's, I'm just so stimulated by that. So since the market took a bit of a, a market took a bit of a tumble, I've decided to sort of step back and create my own study program in tokenomics, create thought leadership and content around best practice. I have a YouTube channel called token design. You can look it up. It should turn up. And I'm also selling a training course that teaches people how to manage a token sale and give them a sober perspective on what's really going on. So you can access that at rmckinley.net slash courses. And uh, yeah, I'm here today because I've worked with both of you and uh, essentially I remain excited and optimistic about where this technology is going to take us. So uh, yeah, that's me. Fantastic. Great. I found yeah, this. And, and I definitely recommend anybody checking out Roderick's YouTube channel. I mean, seriously, there is yeah. this is one, one of the best resources when how shall I start, how shall I start with token economics? This is my favorite go-to because you know, it's, it's on the point. It's accurate. And it's not overwhelming as well. So great stuff. Thank you so much. Fantastic. I won't talk about myself too much because it's about you two guys today and, and uh, what you're doing. As you said, we did meet together, all met. I've been involved in everything from token launches through to some funding, helping projects get funded. And that often sometimes can be the case of, you know, looking at the tokenomics, of course. I mean, there's a lot of things that get involved in funding, but that's one of the things. Roderick is actually, has been one of my advisors on a project too, Mikhail as well. So I won't say I'm biased, but I do like to have the best people to work with. And I believe I have them. And I advise and been involved in blockchain. Well, discovered it really discovered blockchain and technology from the smart contract side, as opposed to the crypto investing side. And that was smart contracts around 2000, what, 16, 17. And I thought there's some great use cases for that. And that's where I really focus on bringing what is a blockchain or a tech stack or software in a way to real use cases to enterprise. And it's about providing a solution to problems. And that's where I come from. So yeah, look, I just want to say uh, thanks for some of the comments in there. Who's this LinkedIn user just says, am I the real one? I am. <laughs> just to reassure you. I don't think AI does that to itself, right? So anyway, let's crack on with... No, that sounds Stacey. like something AI would say. So, That's true. Know. What can I... What can, I'm not going to do something AI would do. So hello, everyone, again. Well, it doesn't gonna, matter, right? What, if I'm a bot or I'm an AI, look, what we're gonna, yeah. just so, 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 so our audience knows, please, please do put questions in the comments. The guys have some questions and some answers, just to say, to some questions that were for this. But this is really about interacting with you, the audience. If you've got any questions, please type them in the comments. They will pop up here and we will get to them. If we can't get to all of them today, they will stay there in the comments and the guys can come to those after we've live stopped live streaming and they can approach them later but we'll do our best to get to them so please just type them in there this is all about being interactive and and working with you and answering your questions we have one already from arnold the, the, the guys can't see the questions by the way i will pop them up to them why don't we look we, we had a backup and we had those ready questions but guys we've got one already should, I, should, I, should we have a look at it nope. let's do it this one's about so to Mikael. And it's Arnold who says, could you provide more details about the token economics of the project <laughs> you mentioned earlier? Additionally, how can we determine if the token economics are sustainable? Or maybe we can make that a general question. Maybe that's, yes. So let's take it step by step. So yes, I mentioned AAA DAO, the, the zero interest lending protocol, and I designed the utility token for this particular project. And the, let's say token utility is mainly the ability to pay back your loans automatically. So the mechanism is that the protocol generates fees and all those fees are pulled together in a cashback pool. And then users who stake the utility token are able to take a part of those fees, but as cashback. So this is not a dividend, this is not passive income. You can only use those fees for repaying uh, basically a credit bar on your, on your loan which basically means that only people who are actually users of the protocol get the benefit of it. And this is how sure that the, let's say, protocol is let's say, not exploited. There is no value extract and that, let's say, everything, the economic value generated by the protocol stays with, with, with the community. So I'm just going to support, highlight two and, points. Uh, oh, sorry, you're, you're still speaking, Mikhail. 
Okay. Oh, so I think the two key points there are that you are limiting value access to people who actually use the protocol. I think in a lot of unsustainable projects, we see the ability to take out value just because, you know, we see a lot of these APY schemes that are, anybody can access just by holding the token. And that does nothing for the economy. And the other thing which, which was relevant in your design is that it's pre-funded. You are paying it out of fees that Correct. have already been collected. There is already value that has been accounted for in your system. So you're not, you're not you know, paying out value that hasn't come in yet, which is the other you know, incredibly widespread error that you see in these, in these designs, because you give people the power to print money, and it's really easy to just push that button one more time and, and print some more in one way or another. They'll call it different things, but it amounts to the same thing. So I think those are two key general pillars for sustainable design that are that you captured with that example. Okay. Well, well said. Well said. So I think what, we'd, what I'd like to do here is, as I said, we had some questions that were set out. And I think this is quite a good one that, that we mentioned in, 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 before we joined. It was, how, let's just sort of make it a bit more high level in general. How do businesses benefit from tokenization, guys? Yeah, um, this question came in because someone was asking just some really basic, we've got a range of people here. Yes. Uh, some people who are looking at this who are saying, why do we care at all to people who are like really into the, into the details now? So I think how do benefit, businesses benefit from tokenization is also yeah. a catch-all for why, why do we even want to do this, right? Exactly. I don't know, Mick answered at the beginning last one. So, Roderick, why don't you start with this one? <laughs> yeah, it, it, this is, I, I still struggle with summarizing this. I think the last time I tried it, I said, blockchain gives us a better way to transfer resources between each other and to conduct business activities. And, and how does it do that at a, at, at a granular level? Well, it allows us to interact with each other directly without needing middlemen. So that means we don't have to pay fees to the middlemen. And then it also, the structure allows us to program it at a very low level. So we can predefine the actions and the agreements that we want to occur. And because of the cryptographic stuff that's going on with the blockchain, we know that those rules will be observed once they are live. So that means that we can run a whole series of very complicated actions automatically, again, without human agency, and automatically and in a way that's highly repeatable and reliable. Now, so long as we've coded those instructions well and correctly, then we can rely on those instructions and, and run them. But that's, that's, those are the two core benefits. And once these things are in place, you can, you can essentially open up your business processes and economic systems to lots of people you don't know. Who may be in all kinds of all parts of the world and and do business with them in a way that's sort of more seamless that has less process overhead less checking and that's that vision for where we're going to end up we're still nowhere near there there's still all kinds of frictions around ux dangers around identity that we still have to iron out but the the end goal is is very promising and that's why a lot of established institutions are making a move now to develop their own technologies and standards right. and products with this technology I don't know, would you, how would you refine that? It's, it's not, I don't find it simple to, to summarize this. <laughs> just just well, for anyone who's it's, coming it's, in, it's the, really... question, the question is how do businesses benefit from tokenization? And that was what, so, so Mikhail, okay. sorry. Uh, actually, I think let, let, people... me just, let me just say that, that, so let's just summarize that. Lower costs, higher automation, more scalability, and yeah, faster, more efficient business processes. That's, that's where it ends up. Mr. Mikhail, your thoughts? Yes, this is, yeah, this is great. This is great. So. It's, it's very funny because we talked about background in economics and I remember my classes when we covered the theory of the firm and trying to understand why people organize themselves or enterprises as, as firms to, to begin with. And it's all about the transaction costs. Right? So, so if you're an independent actor and you're transacting with other independent actors, well, but I, as, as long as the risk of this interaction is low, if you are interacting with known parties and if you're interacting with somebody that you've done business before and this is why enterprises tend to grow because it's safer to internalize all the processes than deal with a lot of independent parties and what blockchain does is help is helping us creating tools that actually lower those transaction costs because they're lowering risk of of interactions and let's say this is very very high level theory but in very practical way this is also something that i believe roderick will appreciate from the project finance. I remember that ever, let's say, since solar energy became feasible on a commercial scale, there were numerous attempts to create some sort of crowdfunding or crowd lending facilities 
to help bring capital into the renewable energy space. And they failed for two main reasons. Number one is that the admin cost of administering private investment of the globe were very high. So it didn't make any sense. There was no advantage versus just going to a commercial bank to get the loan. And the second thing is there was no liquidity or secondary market for those instruments, which basically means that private individuals were left with an asset for the maturity of the whole contract, which in renewable energy can be I don't know, 15 years, 20 years, I mean, maybe, maybe 10. And you know, I was personally involved in the tokenization project for renewable energy in, in sub-Saharan Africa, where what happened was because of the blockchain technology and because of introducing tokens that represent those solar loans, number one, the admin costs go, let's say, almost to zero because the, the solar developer only interacts with a single staking contract. But basically, once every month or every quarter, they just transfer the stable coins that they're due. And then people who have tokens, they interact with the smart contract and they take whatever is due all to them. And you can have fractional ownership. You can have, you know, a tiny fraction of, of, of a token token still makes sense. And the second thing, what is possible is that if you have uh, tokens that are easily transferable on chain, they can also be tra traded, which basically means in box, you have this opportunity of creating secondary market with, with liquidity, which now is a complete game changer, right? So, so this is, this is why companies can use blockchain technology and tokenization. You have business cases that were completely impossible be before this technology existed. So, mm. so just to try, that's an, I, you've told me about that example, and I think it's a really good one as well. Just to sort of like try and tie that into the core sort of end benefits that blockchain delivers, you know, before you would have to create all these contracts and ownership contracts to sell to everybody, and you would need like a bunch of lawyers involved, and it would be a lot, a lot to manage for every new right. Now everything's sort of like done by an automatic contract. So all of that overhead's gone. You post these tokens on exchanges, and before that was all, you know, its own army of middlemen. That's gone. It's now automated. It's all done by smart contracts. So suddenly it no longer becomes expensive to give people really small shares of ownership that are that are tradable. Um, these were things that were prohibitively expensive before and that blockchain makes cheaper. And the end economic result of that is that people who have smaller budgets can take part in financing solar infrastructure where they weren't able to before and were able to connect this popular interest in supporting green energy developments up with with people you know who may not be you know these giant investors and may just want to put their money and and from the project's point of view that lowers the cost of capital because now they have more investors available who will offer capital so the cost of buying that capital goes down so this is sort of like there are so many win win wins on all sides and this is all being delivered at the, you know because of the technology just cuts out all these middlemen and automates a lot of stuff and that's yeah. that's how we see these end results coming in so it's really it's really hard to explain because it's so general purpose and value sort of flows and effects go in so many directions here. But yeah, that's, it's, it's a great example, Mikhail. I mean, we've got a question here that is kind of topical as well, especially with, well, it, a lot's been happening, but especially this week. And, and it's, it's relevant, I think, to maybe what you just said, but it's from Freddie. So do you think the evolution, I think, or, or, you know, or the compliance situation, I think he's saying, may limit these benefits that you're mentioning, you know, such as lower fees and, and no middlemen, Roderick, you know, as you were just saying, and, and what's your thoughts there? I know you're not compliance experts, but of course, maybe, no, maybe. It, it, it obviously will, but, it, but it will still be an improvement on what we have. Yes. That's, that's it. And it will still be a material improvement on what we have. I'm pro regulation. We, we, it's too easy to abuse this stuff. It really is. It's yeah. and, 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 and regulation won't get it perfect. There'll be things that, you know, don't fit a few edge cases. Averages require compromises, but it's still better for everyone involved. So yes, we will still, there will still be some paperwork. You know, some things might not be fully on chain, but getting us to use this technology more broadly may be a first step towards, you know, removing some of that red tape once we get more, more used to it. So yes is the short answer, but, but it's still a good thing. Okay. Mikael, any, any thoughts? <laughs> Look, we live in a world that is regulated. Yeah. I mean, the, the fact that we live in a civilized world, it means that it is regulated. So it's not the survivors of the fittest. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we need regulation. Oh, and people West. forget that the internet, ha yeah, that the internet hasn't really took off until it has been regulated. And, you know, Al Gore has something to do with it, right? He, he signed a bill that actually allowed the use of the internet for commercial use as well, right? And then this opened up, let's say, the whole platter of, you know, the, the Web2 revolution that has been happening recently. So 
look, I, I think looking at, for example, the, the, the coming MICA regulations and some, some other regulations in, in different jurisdictions, even the regulators are aware of the fact that there has to be a lot of leeway for experiments. And this is why even regulators introduce different, let's say, let's say value thresholds for, for projects. So if you're s small enough, and this is sort of like a proof of concept implementation of something, well, go ahead. We, 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 we're not going to, you know, penalize you. But if, if you grow and if you now become like a you know, market standard, for example, of course you have to be regulated because if you don't, I mean, look what happened to the... Yeah, so this is, there are a number of jurisdictions that are bringing in sandbox regimes, yeah, which allow, allow for, you know, a special suspension of normal regulatory conditions, provided other conditions are met. So Europe, Singapore, I believe Hong Kong, the UK, it's nowhere to be seen in the US, alas. But, uh, you know, they, they, this, I think, is a constructive approach. So saying, okay, we believe this is new and we're open-minded to trying new things out as long as there's sort of like a, a border perimeter here. And in what I was reading about the European sandboxes, they would be like, okay, you're allowed to request to us to suspend any number of these regulations, provided that you explain to us how you are going to compensate for the, the safety deliverable that this measure was meant to create. So that's really interesting. That allows people to sort of say, okay, we know you're trying to do this to protect people for this, but we want to try this. And then they'll be, okay, let's see how it works. And, and I, think, I think that's a very constructive approach. Now, some people will say, oh, the, this is no good. It limits experimentation to the biggest, most established institutions. I, 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 I don't know. I, I think that's better than nothing. And, and actually, the biggest institutions are probably going to innovate with the simplest, smallest things first and, and build out from there. So even if they are the only ones who get access to a sandbox, that's, that's still better than nothing. I think, sadly, a lot of retail crypto solutions are blockchain solutions are really, really wild. Yeah. And it is very, very hard to, yeah, they are. <laughs> they, are. No, they are, they are. Like, they I are love like... them. I love, I, I've been attracted to that punky spirit. There's, there's, there's no yeah. question, but we have to acknowledge that it is, you know, it's too much risk for a lot of ordinary investors. And if we want to save the reputation of this industry, we, you know, we have to accept going a little bit more slowly before, before we run away with ourselves like that. Yeah. And look, I mean, just to kind of round up, because we're getting kind of a lot of questions, and, you know, obviously, because of what's happening about, about exchanges and regulators and things like this, which we, we're going to try and keep this on, on tokenomics at this stage. And mm -hmm. maybe we can, you know, we've touched on this because it was relevant. But I mean, my view just is, is, I keep it kind of very simple, is that if you are handing responsibility to a third party, which effectively an exchange or, or, or you know, or, or anyone that's sort of taking responsibility from you, then it should be regulated too, because because you know you need to make sure that, that they're taking care of something that you're giving them that care you know that that, that care of. Uh, if you're sticking to pure DeFi, it's up to you, right? I mean, if you want if you want to start taking the risks on you, but if you're handing that responsibility over, my view is yes, it should be regulated because the risk is, is no longer with you; it's with the person you're tr you know having to trust. But then that's kind of like not decentralized. But that's another conversation, and that's an that's another live stream we can do next time. We're we're already thirty minutes in. Shall we start bringing in AI? Would you like to? Yeah, I mean, let's do that. Let's do that. Okay, so I just thought it gives people, you know, then we can turn over to, to questions. But at least, uh, you know, let's do it. Go on then. Around the subject, it, it, let's it bring something because, um, because, yeah, because, because, as you know, I've, I've done some some AI work before, not mm -hmm. ChatGPT. Like in, in, this is how Roderick and I met. I mean, I, I, with uh, with my AI business that's with blockchain. And uh, Roderick, how? Well, we, or, or I mean, the question we have is, why are AI and blockchain? This is a big one. Such a good fit for each other. Yeah, I, I think this is basically fundamental to, to understand. Blockchains are data. They are absolutely nothing more and nothing less than, than data. And, and if you, you know, the way, the reason why I think this is such a momentous event that AI is developing and blockchain are developing at the same time is that if you consider how impressed we've been with what we've been able to achieve by letting a certain kind of AI model roam the internet and learn stuff with ChatGPT, yeah. Consider that what we're doing with blockchains is that we're making economic data visible, digitally readable by machines. So in the same way that the internet gave machines a lens on a very, you know, a certain parts of our lives, the, the kind of information we like to share and exchange between each other, blockchains will be given, giving machines a lens on our economic activity. And, you know, 
I'm sure some people are absolutely terrified at that idea. And some people are like, you know, yes, machine overlords, take us now. Yeah, um, go, just but, come on. <laughs> I, I, I'm personally optimistic. And, and I think it's very exciting because uh, I, I believe human capacities are limited. And, and we do such a terrible job of managing our own economies because we don't know any better. And, and I personally believe that putting that to machine learning and, and guidance can help improve the way we manage ourselves. And this is this goes beyond how much we spend here and there. This goes into how we manage our material resources in the economy, how much carbon is being generated by all of these things that we do. What happens to the metal in the car once it ends up in the scrap heap? It's it's really it goes in all kinds of directions that I feel very optimistic about. But before machi the machines can learn, we have to we have to make it visible to them. So understanding that blockchains are just data and that they encode economic data is, is the key to understanding why there is complementarity between these two technologies. So open data sets as opposed to di siloed data sets. Okay, I, I can go one here. Like there's this thing called federated machine learning. Yes. Where you can, you can get a machine learning algorithm to learn on your private data set, something that you can only see. Yes. And then using blockchain technology, you can hide, still keep that data private, but somehow a higher order machine learning algorithm manages to learn what the other machine learning algorithms did <laughs> and manages to learn from them without revealing that private data set. Got it. So this is federated machine learning and it's one of the ideas that's being developed in, in conjunction with blockchain mm. technology. I have to add that on a, on a more, not quite on that advanced level, but this is what, and this is, I don't want to plug this, we did at Guardians at blockchain, gbc.ai about detecting scams. And it was actually, it was that data that was available, blockchain data that was available and the smart contracts that often are open as well and open source that enabled us to create, you know, create data sets to create those algorithms that can help spot potential scams and scam tokens. So that's kind of like how we approach security with, with Wallet Guardian, which Roderick knows very well because he's an advisor of gvc.ai. Mikhail, any thoughts AI and, and blockchain? Sure, plenty. So I have one very cool specific example how, let's say, part of the blockchain stuff and AI can work together is in the area of establishing consensus. So let's say you have a set of data inputs and now you have different models that analyze those data, but now you have to, let's say, establish some sort of output as the end of this whole process. And, you know, it's, it's also something I've been personally involved work with, working with the, one of the projects. These guys are developing consensus algorithms for AI that, for example, determines uh, fire hazards in buildings, uh, where you have a building that has, let's say, 10,000 different IoT sensors. And if something is happening, something is triggered within those sensors, how you determine whether you're going to trigger a fire alarm or not. Triggering a uh, firing, uh, fire alarm can potentially save uh, a lot of people, but can potentially also disrupt you know, work and potentially a lot of value will be being produced, right? But triggering this alarm, you, you basically, you know, somebody's life can be in danger. So this idea of using different independent nodes with different reputation and different voting power, voting on an outcome of, of a process and then collectively agreeing on, on a decision. I, I think it's a fascinating one. And another specific example is something that I've been recently thinking about in the context of AI-generated content and different AI-generated content. You can have, you know, blog posts that are AI-generated and videos, photos that so I mean, you can see that soon they are going to be as real as it gets, uh, that they're indistinguishable for, for human eye. So how, how do we know which news are news, which news is fake news? Well, you know, there is this <laughs> cool little feature called, you know, a cryptographic signature that is well adopted in the, in, in the blockchain space. And uh, we might as well have an Isamory protocol that digitally signs every piece of content that is being produced and published on the internet. And you can have a situation where you can have humans that attest that this piece of content was generated by a human, for example, themselves or somebody. And you can also have machine algorithms that are digitally signing a piece of content that they've created. So everybody knows it's AI generated. And then you're going to have this sort of gray space in between that hasn't been signed, right? Or hasn't been validated in, in a provable way yet. And, and, and then you're going to be able to very quickly, you know, shift and sort and, and react, other, let's say, inadequate manner, depending on what you're expecting. Because sometimes, you know, for some low volume transactions or interaction, it doesn't really matter who was the source of the, of 
the content. And sometimes you definitely need to have a cryptographic proof that a photo was taken by, by our video mm -hmm. taken by a real person in the uh, real world. And, you know, for example, there's a company trying to crack it, our body cams of police officers. Right. Actually, it reminded me of something. I was at Davos in, in January for the blockchain business and set up and it was Hedera House and somebody's got up and I have to apologize if they're listening. If anyone's interested, I'll, I'll dig it out. I can't remember the name of the, of the project now, but they were saying that they had taken, there were lots of photos being taken at a war site, like in Ukraine, basically. And they said, well, those were then being logged into the blockchain with the time and the date. Actually, the analogy they used was an evidence bag, like a plastic evidence bag, where you know you, you, you see maybe, maybe your police officer, you know this, or you see it in the films, right? Where you write the details, the time, the place, and you log it and everything else. Well, they're saying that's effectively what they were doing with, with, the, with the blockchain to, and then, then later that can be used for whatever reason, whether it goes to a criminal court or something else, right? So you remind me of that. It was something that, we, that I saw when I was there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look, it's this, this provenance thing is, is very broad as well. I mean, it's even sort of like, how do you prove that this, uh, this rare whiskey really came from, from, uh, you know, where they said it did and stuff, yeah. no, it's being applied or in carbon credits, like, how do we know that this project really did offset this much carbon? So this, this idea of authentication is, is run, is, is a very broad concern and, and we're seeing it apply to various kinds of applications in the space. Now this, now this got me thinking, I was going to bring, and I'm going to go actually go on to another one of the, the questions because it's related to one of the ideas, the themes we had from the slide. And, it's, and there's actually a question here that's tied into this. Maybe I'll start with that, but I was going to say, how, how, would, you, how would you bring a tokenomics? Where, how, okay, here's it. Carbon credits or what you say, or, or, or traceability. Could you bring some kind of incentive tokenization into that? Yeah, I guess you can, but I mean, because we're, I'm, I'm thinking like, okay, a blockchain for mutability, but what about actually creating a project? How, what about some of these carbon credits and that we're seeing? There's a lot of that popping up now. Well, well, some of the carbon credits are, you know, it's, it's been a while since I've looked at these systems, but essentially these, these credits and incentives tend to cycle in, in quite siloed sorts of parties. The fact, you, you know, for example, you know, by design, the, the European carbon trading scheme excluded loads of industries and, and basically focused it on power or, or a few things. So that by design was siloed in, in certain industries. If it isn't by design, you know, that means that, that you can't include the entire economic chain in the, in the incentive structure. Whereas if these things are fully tradable between all agents, then that expands the scope for the incentives to, 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 to move further down and maybe even give, offer some flexibility over how those incentives are expressed and managed between particular companies and, and their consumer bases. So that's, that's a, at a really, mm. really high level. But actually what's, what's really interesting about carbon tokenization and any real world tokenization is that there is a one-to-one -one relationship between some physical stuff and something you are putting on the blockchain. And I think that introduces a lot of discipline into the basic design that I think is really necessary because a lot of people have been leaning into, we can print and destroy tokens here and there and, and, and that creates a lot of confusion. If we have to do something quite boring and say that for every ton of carbon, we have, you know, one million tokens, that, that introduces a lot of discipline that, that, that I think gets us to design a little more carefully and then, you know, maybe add pretty modest sort of incentive layers on top of that, that don't just print money in order, in order to create an incentive and, and that wreck the entire system in the process. Yes, Art, and maybe I can add that we can design any incentive structure but we need to keep in mind that at the end of the day, somebody has to pay the bill. So there has to be somebody who is paying for this whole system that we're designing. Yeah. And, you know, I can imagine that there can be a voluntarily, let's say, opted in system for, you know, capturing carbon credits or renewable energy that is global and that is ultimately supported by consumers who are willing to pay a premium on products that are verifiably sustainable, whatever this is going to mean. And if we can, but, but this is a, let's say, fundamental question. It's true that there is sufficient market, there is sufficient market demand for people who are willing to pay extra for getting this information. And if it, it is in, in, in fact true, then we can have a, a lot Collaborate system with you know we're going to tokenize various assets. We're going to tr trace them <coughs> and track them through the whole of the supply chain. And then, depending on the let's say value added of each of the contributor of the supply chain, then we distribute those incentives that are coming from from mm -hmm. consumers. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Now we we also spoke about 
tokenization templates and can they work? Um, so I think we're going to dial this back a bit into, and let's, let's go a bit more high level. Now we have a question actually from Zeshan, sorry Zeshan. Now without doing sort of going into great detail, I mean, but effectively this is kind of tied into that question. Does a template work? I mean, this is what he's, can you, can you see this guys? This is, he has a, a gaming, I'm looking at gaming project, a blockchain game. And uh, maybe again, this maybe could be a bit more general about templates, but maybe with this as a, as a lead. What about templates? I mean, do, do, do we have, I think it's very, in my mind, it's very specific to the, the project and the protocol and the service. Would you agree? Or, or can we, can we just go with the templates? Michael, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always on. Roger is going to get emotive about this one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 no. I said, I, please go ahead. Cool, Michael. You okay. kick off this one. So, so I think templates are necessary and the fact that we don't have templates for sustainable economics only means that we are very early in the game because the, the, the same way, like we watch very, very old documentaries, like black and white footage of people building the first flying machines. I mean, you look at this stuff and it's ridiculous, right? Because now we understand <laughs> how a plane works and we, we know how you build the plane. And there were numerous attempts that look completely ridiculous and they all fail. But I mean, this is the learning by natural selection. And I think this is what's also happening in our space right now, where people are, let's say, trying different stuff. I wouldn't say throwing spaghetti at the wall, but it kind of looks like that. And it's the survival of the fittest. Those uh, models that survive and actually make sense, they can be generalized and turned into templates. And, you know, even the model of proof of stake in general, you have a network of the centralized nodes and earn rewards. And then you also have some sort of economic buy-in to the game that can be slashed that you can potentially use. I think it's a great template. It's, it has so many wonderful applications. And you know, even in the, in the business world where you want to onboard a group of either suppliers or well, may, many suppliers, but also clients into a marketplace at, at a very, very local notch. I mean, this works brilliantly. All, say all the staking and slashing mechanism, and then having some sort of reward that is connected to performing actual work that is valuable for, for the network. That's a great template. So I hope we're going to see more and more of this. And it's like, you know, we, we have a business model for a SaaS company, like business model canvas for, for, for a SaaS company. Everybody understands this, and it wasn't that clear to 20, 20 years ago. So. Okay, Rodrik, over to you. What do you? What do you? Yeah, I, I think I think we we are going to make use of templates, but actually, <clears throat> we need to get we need to templatize at a lower level, right? We need we need to define standards around some of the lower level components that make up our economies first. I don't think we've gotten mm -hmm. in there. You know, if 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 I tell you, you know, if we think of a basic financial instruments, we know what a we know what a, a bond is or or a loan is, and we know what equity is. We I mean, there are always details in the terms, but we know what the basic outlines of those are, and those two instruments have been standardized to a degree that we can work with them. In, 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 and, and plan things out to, in considerable detail before we get to the, the, the sort of fine script. And I don't think that our design of economies at the economy level really knows, we don't know what parts we're working with yet. So I think we've actually got a way to go before we can come up with general economic templates. To speak to uh, Zashan's question here, this, this, this issue is not, you know, the, the, how you slice up the pie chart is not enough information to determine whether these tokens yeah. are going to be used are going to result in a sustainable economy, right? We don't, know how you're generating revenue. <laughs> we don't know how you're how you're spending all of these tokens. We don't know what what market makers you have on board, what treasury management principles. We don't know. There's so much stuff that goes into that goes into determining whether this is going to be a sustainable economy. Actually, you know, the surprising thing is that how you divide up the pie chart doesn't actually matter all that much. There aren't strong economic principles to guide that, that actually becomes guided by market expectations. And, and the way I approach these solutions is to look at what's going on in the market and make sure that investors are seeing something that looks like what, they're, what they've seen before and what they're seeing else, else there. But actually, in, in economic terms, these are not sufficient conditions to create sustainability in the token economy. There's so much more that needs to go in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. If, if you want to address this particular questions, I would say that, yeah, absolutely. The, the most important thing for me is defining the actual utility on organic demand to, for the token. So basically how it's created and this, you know, pie chart and slicing and dicing, it's only about bar bargaining power of different stakes.
And, and, and then I'm popping this question up, guys, because again, it's, it's a use case. I mean, it, it, he's asking about play to earn. So, I mean, what, what are your thoughts here? You go, Mikhail. So, uh, as I mentioned a, a while ago, we can have any, at the end of the day, somebody has to pay the bill. So, if my whole business value proposition is that I'm rising demand for my product, then the question is like, why do I even come up with this product? That. Maybe the whole business is not sustainable. And this is not a token economic specific questions, because if you think about the company like WeWork, right? it's, it, it, it's a you know, case in point. You, know, you, you had a business that were spending more dollars on customer acquisition than this particular customer would bring to the business throughout their whole lifetime. It's, it's not sustainable. So if you have a game that requires people to let's say it requires you to pay people for playing this game well maybe this game is not so fun to play because building an ecosystem at some point there has to be somebody who's bringing external value to this whole whole uh, setup if you don't, then you can stop right there it's never going to be sustainable but yeah, say, on, on the other hand it's absolutely it is absolutely possible to des design a sustainable token economics for, for a Web3 game. Absolutely, there are ways of doing it. So I'm going to shut up, let, let, let you guys. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, look, if you're playing a game, you, you want to enjoy the game, right? You're not playing it because it's a blockchain game. <laughs> so, you know, it's like there's a lot of instances of, of various worlds and games that, that I know of that don't use blockchain, they're hugely popular. For sure, you could probably find some great tokenomic models to bake into those because they've already got the users enjoying it and, and, and there's some mm -hmm. value to extract. But it's kind of the wrong way around, isn't it? What we've seen in the last, whatever, two or three years is, hey, blockchain's really cool. A lot of investors pumping money into it. Let's build a game that's using blockchain. The game actually isn't as good as pretty much anything else out there. It's probably worse. And then they wonder why no one's using it. And, and, and it's like, well, because you, it's a tech stack. Build a great, enjoyable, compelling <clears throat> game that people want to use and then put some blockchain in, in the back end if it works in that use case. Do you agree, Roderick? Yeah, I think I think the people who developed some of these runaway games did not did not have that sort of game development background. I, I think so. Like, I I love the video game space because as as a nerd, like I think it offers some of the richest possibilities for economic design. Where you're like, you you just have these fantastic situations where you can really build entire economic scenarios, and 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 you have people who are willing and interested in 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 playing in those games, and you can potentially learn a lot. Now, where we come into some trouble is on, on, on the proposal of a Web3 game, of a GameFi game, which says, we're going to open this economy so that value can come out as well as go into the economy. Now, when you do that, you attract a different base of player, right? Yeah. So it, it, to some extent, this problem becomes unstable because the more successful you become at a keeping value in the game, the more attractive that honeypot becomes <laughs> so to, to attract people who want to steal the honeypot. Exactly. So the only way I see this working is if open, you know, value going out is highly restricted, which dampens, in some sense, fundamentally dampens the the the, the initial appeal of of the of the GameFi proposition. Or we end up in a game economy where there are so many open, successful game economies that that sort of speculative, you know, extractive pressure is sort of more diffuse and and sort of like has more places to go and. And you can have sort of like a network of more open open economies. So I think it's 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 a really interesting space. I take I take an interest in what's going on there, but at the same time, I think it's 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 trying to fly before it can walk. And we we have to focus on the traditional game experience and you know keep a lot of control controls in place in order to make sure it's not attractive to extractors who who you know kill the whole thing. Hmm. Thanks. Just looking here, we've on the hour, we've got seven minutes. We are able to overrun, but I'm just, just keeping that in mind if, if you are. But we've got another AI. Where has it gone? There was another AI question going back here. Yeah, machine learning. Let's have a look at this. Oh, this is above my pay grade. <laughs> no, I mean, like the, 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 when you get down to this, this true stuff of consensus mechanisms, you need you, you you need like PhD level information to really give an accurate and precise answer to these kind of things. Why would I, I, I kind of from what I know, I don't really see how these parts add up. I don't know why, why we're bringing these things together. Yeah, uh, that's fine. We can I mean, yeah. yeah.
we get a get a. I, you know, I know you're keen on AI, Roderick, but I, I thought I'd just give you a quick test. So we test, test, test your, as you say, your pay grade. I'm not, I'm not going to BS my way out of anything. Um, no, well, that's why we, that's why it. you're here. That's why you're both here, and that's why I'm here because we hate BS, and there's a lot of it on LinkedIn. So let's not, let's not contribute to it anymore. <laughs> right. Not to the question. Talking about my skills and understanding. No, oh no, 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 no. I don't let's know not... anything about the proof of war. You know, this kind. No, of you don't know. It's fine. This is this. So what... I, I'm, I'm not going to be able to. Explain that's the way we roll that. here. That's the way we roll. We don't try and baffle with bullshit and with, with the answers, not the questions we're talking about here. Mikhail, you're not an AI. Do you, do you want to pass on that one? <laughs> have you got a view? Well, look, the, my, no, I'd say my, my comment on this is, is, is going to be the following. I guess it is possible to build something like this, but my question would be, I mean, who would do it and for what purpose? Right. Because if you are in the AI business and you have a very, very strict needs, you have a, and you want to train your model. So the question is like, okay, you need to pay somebody for computational power to train this model. So if we're going to outsource it to independent node, this is going to be cheaper. Mm -hmm. Because if, if it's not going to be cheaper, then everybody will rent it from Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. or, or, mm -hmm. or other cloud provider. Mm -hmm. And then you have this added layer of complexity of, OK, you're going to have nodes that are going to do this machine learning stuff, and they're going to mint blocks and receive block rewards. Well, then the blockchain for that. Maybe you just need a stable coin to pay for your computational power, and and that's it. Right? You don't need a blockchain for it. You don't need a proof of use for sort of protocol. Yeah. Okay. So I think I think what's thrown me here is the proof of useful work protocol bit. If if you know, based on what you guys were just saying, if we're talking about a marketplace for for where data and com computational machine learning power is sort of like bought and sold. Absolutely. That sort of stuff mm. is being developed. So we're talking, yes. you know, there are marketplaces for cloud infrastructure, for computing infrastructure. There are Ocean Protocol is trying to create an economy around yep. data that can be and more useful data earns a rent based on the amount of times it's it's used. So there are if, if, if the questions really oriented around, you know, how do we create a market economy that incentivizes and rewards computational power and machine learning? And then, you know, DSI, decentralized science is trying to do interesting things where, you know, the fruits of machine learning models can be sort of traced back. Again, we're talking about all this traceability, right? So the, it, a model that was created out of a set of research papers, you know, can drive value back to the creators of those research papers. There is, uh, there's a lot of interest and thought going behind creating these marketplaces that, yeah, can, can leverage the value of all this data that's, that's sitting around out there. Okay, guys, look, we are closing in on 60 minutes. We, uh, there's quite a nice question here, I think. And it kind of, it's, it's almost like a little bit from the intro, but this is from, well, I've lost it, from Andrew. And, and he says, why are you personally investing your time and resources into blockchain technology? I think it's a great one to finish on, right? What is your driver? <laughs> is it freedom, stability, pure economics, for example? And what do you see perhaps, which others, including he, Andrew, can't see yet, at least? Or maybe he can after this last 60 minutes i think it's quite a nice closer yeah <laughs> i know you it's a great it's a great closer yeah okay you want me to go first yeah come go on, on then okay so i i'm an economics nerd i i love economics i you know i i loved my in college when i got to learn it and i'm also a very practical person and this is why i ended up in project finance because i had this sort of feeling that I'm doing something, let's say modeling something, creating some small but still an economy that helps the world somehow, like mm -hmm. we were creating something. And I noticed that, the, that there is a similar possibility with blockchain, where we can create socioeconomic incentive structures that will guide human behavior towards something better. And I mean, this is very, very, let's say, esoteric and, and high level. But it, to, to, to make it a bit more concrete and specific. So I've seen a project, you know, I'm also involved in a project that shows people how you can have a lending protocol that doesn't charge any recurring interest, which, which is huge, you know, in, in terms of self, let's say, sovereign finance and in terms of pulling people out of poverty, potentially. I'm, I've also seen projects that can enable mass scale financing for renewable energy that was not possible before. There are ways of creating you know, local currencies for you know, municipalities or you know, 
villages or, or specific industries that they, they can have their own sustainable economy around those currencies that is completely federal or central government. Right? This is also a fascinating subject for me. You know, lo loyalty reward space as well. I think we have a really, really good chance at you know cracking loyalty reward on the blockchain soon. I'm involved yeah. in one of those uh, projects. And I really think that this can be a way out of this incredible vicious cycle of paid advertising and paid marketing and everybody competing for our attention and stealing our data. You know, there is the consumer, there is a brand, and these can be connected in a way without any intermediary that is trying to steal out both of them. So, I mean, this is why I'm in this space, because I love economics and I see a transformational potential of, of this technology. Mm. So, so over awesome. to you guys. Rodrigo, as I first knew you, and before the, you became Roderick. I, I, I put my, my face and my hands there because it really, my response to this question does depend on which day you wake me up, which side of the bed I've, I've gotten out, <laughs> out of. You know. Give us today's I'm an, response. I'm an independent advisor, so, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm doing this by myself. And, and some days I'm like, Oh my God, everything. This is my first bear market. I only, I only got into the space in, when everything was super hot in 21. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm like, <laughs> is this, is this real? Is this, am I going to have a future in this? What's going on? But then the days that I, I do get animated by this stuff, I think your comment, Mikhail, about being an economics nerd is, is absolutely pertinent. It will. I think you're a nerd as well. We, 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 we bonded <laughs> over that on, on one of our early phone calls. Yeah. And, and what being a nerd, it, it gives you this understanding of some incredible general purpose benefits that are just, you know, they're always saying, give us an example, give us an example. And you, you're like struggling because you, you understand the deep principle, but you don't, you don't see it implemented or expressed successfully, but you know, it's there. Yeah. And what I, what's been giving me a lot of encouragement is that I'm seeing you know, JP Morgan, Goldman yep. Sachs, EY, the Monetary Authority of Hong, Monetary Authority of Hong Kong, the European Investment Bank, all of these people who are not idiots, who are not, you know, moon boys, they, they are they're talking about the technology the way we've been talking about it today. And yes. they are putting capital and they're building stuff behind it. And, and they see the same things that, that all of us see here. And that gives me reassurance. Okay. I'm not, I'm not just in cl on cloud cuckoo land here. This is, this is real and, and it's happening and, you know, concrete examples as well. I heard of companies, you know, loans that are being U S dollar loans that are being accessed by small and medium sized companies in sub-Saharan Africa. You tell me what part of our conventional financial infrastructure provides that kind of service to people. Yeah. Now this is entirely facilitated by blockchain. Now, it's we're in this funny situation where blockchain was birthed by this crypto punk aspiration. And, and, you know, that had some validity and, you know, in the heat of the 2008 financial crisis. And it also enables all of these adverse and nefarious activities. So we have this very confused proposition. We've been saturated with this idea of this technology being a bad thing. We see all the terrible headlines and it's really difficult for people to wrap their heads around how this can be both. <laughs> <laughs> terrible and amazing at the same time. But that goes back to the incredible general purpose nature of this technology, which allows it to fan out into, into you know, terrible use cases and use cases that are amazing. But, but I think we are beginning to see the tide change just in, in virtue of, you know, the kind of players that are getting involved now that are there joining the conversation and adding capital and expertise to, mm -hmm. to these efforts. So that's, that's what gives me reassurance. And then I'm excited to be, to be part of this big change and I hope to see a better world on the other side of it. Yeah. From my side, it's pretty much echoes what you both said, but certainly Roderick, I'm very excited. I mean, I've, I've always been an early adopter. You say I'm a geek, you, you knew that. We both geeked out when we first met, the first meeting we had to discuss things. And Mika, I think you know, you know that too. We can go off on one as well. But certainly being early with this new technology, which I think is, you know, I don't want you, I don't like the analogy, but I think, you know, I remember when I first did use dial up and I remember when I first did access a static web page. I think it's like when, uh, and the excitement there. I remember the first SMS I sent to someone and nobody knew what it was. And they're like, what is this? I didn't know that. I love being on that first level. And, and I, I genuinely believe everything you said, you both said about this technology and what it's going to be, what it's starting to do. And, and, and the tech stack it is, it is extremely exciting. And just to echo again, what you're saying about, you know, industry and enterprise, Roderick, as you and maybe some other people know, because I do put a lot of posts on LinkedIn, I, I get around a lot of blockchain conferences. And these are very much since the last year 
full of enterprise. I mean, in blue chip enterprises in all sorts of industry, not just the financial and the banking industry that Roderick mentioned, everything from supply chain to, to agricultural to, I mean, you name it. You know, I saw Sony walking around the other day. I've seen, you know, I saw oh, uh, Paris blockchain. I bumped a guy like Paris Saint-Germain football team with a, you know, a guy representing them. Okay, I don't know if it's NFT, but I mean, it's just a few. I mean, I can't actually list them because this, I see so many and I talk to these people. They are all looking at how they can use blockchain technology to enhance their business processes and also use it for community and then incentives and all the things that Mikhail touched on. So look, we're, we're at one minute seven. There's a lot of guys, you'll see when, when, we, when we, we, we stop this broadcast, there's still a lot of questions and there's some questions in, in the comments. Maybe you can have a look at that. It'd be great if you can have a look and maybe you can answer some of those. If anyone has any more questions or wants to contact us, of course, this is LinkedIn. You can access and direct message us quite easily. You can look at our profiles. You can do a number of things, which is what we quite like about the B2B side of, of LinkedIn. I think we all just want to thank you for being here. Yeah, and thank you both guys for, for joining us this evening. Yeah, great questions from the audience. Really enjoyable. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I think the questions are the testimony to the fact that the industry is maturing yes. and we are attracting more, more and more, you know, quality projects, quality because, I mean, these were pretty advanced questions and I really enjoyed asking great. them. So to, to that was great. Thank you. Okay. Well, look, uh, thanks. Yeah. Well, I hope if it's wherever you are in the world, either have a nice breakfast, good lunch, a nice dinner or a good sleep. And we'll, we'll think, look, if anyone would like to mention, please, please come on to my LinkedIn if you want, or, or, or make a comment to this about what you'd like to see discussed at the next live stream. We have done Mika, the, the regulation two or three months ago with fantastic experts. You can find that by searching my posts on LinkedIn. There was also one with Mika, Mikhail before with Tokenomics, but now it was so, such a demand. We brought on Roderick too and done another one. We're, we're, I'm open to suggestions. I want to hear what you'd like to know more about. And as I say, bring you some real experts from a crowd of non-experts that, or non-expert experts that LinkedIn is, is attracting as well. So thanks again, everyone. And we really appreciate you, you interacting and, and, and thanks for great questions. Thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure. Bye-bye. Thanks.